Well, I appreciate the opportunity to come again to the McFarland Pheasant Conference. And it's kind of ironic that I'm a, one of the most popular speakers because about the closest I come to game birds was the duck that I ate last night. I, I'm not a big, don't know, we don't have a lot of game birds where I am or don't work it. But what I would like to do is kind of share with you some practical knowledge that we're learning on the poultry side of lighting and water and then I think there's some opportunity to apply that to what you might be doing in your operations. So first off, let's see if it's going to advance. Yeah, we go. I want to just, this is a little bit different up front from what's in your book, so just kind of bear with me a minute. Just want to kind of get us all on the same page about light, you know. Vision is the dominant sense in our domestic fowl and our wild birds. I mean, they're on the bottom of the totem pole, so they're going to have to uh, be able to see their predators in order to stay out of trouble. And then light also stimulates internal cycles due to the day length change. So now as we're coming into spring, as Bill said, you know, the day lengths increase and that's what stimulates our birds in the wild to reproduce. And it's going to initiate the hormone release. And birds sense light through their eyes, through retinal photoreceptors, and they also sense through photosensitive receptors in the brain. So they can actually, the red wave links in the light can actually penetrate the skull and um, stimulate these sensors. So what is light? You know, it, well, it's just the il visible electromagnetic radiation. There's your $10 word for the day. And wavelength is the color of light. And it's your, the retinal receptors are sensitive to the short wavelengths. The blue-green spectrum promotes growth. And then the brain receptors, the hypothalamus, it's going to be sensitive to the long wavelengths, which is the orange-red spectrum. That's what stimulates reproduction. And if we look at kind of, you know, comparison of wavelengths of sensitivity of poultry and humans, Humans, we only have four photoreceptors, so we kind of have a narrow band of um, perception of light. Poultry birds have four photoreceptors, so they actually can perceive light down here in the um, blue, the violet blue area, and that's just kind of for that twilight night. They are able to see some things that we can't see at night. So just we're fairly similar in what we can see with them adding in this additional in the um, bluer wavelengths. Now, kind of important properties of visual environment, well, light intensity or luminance, that's the total quantity of light emitted by a light source. And I'm kind of laying this down because you start getting into lights, you can get overwhelmed really quick by all the terminology and what everybody's saying. Color temperature. Is the light warm, neutral, cool? And kind of an example of that, if you look at the little guys here, they're, they're a warm light, whereas our fluorescents here are kind of more of a cool range light. So that right here, we've got two different examples of that. Temporal flickering, birds are more sensitive to it. We, like in compact fluorescents, they have a flicker. We don't sense that. Our birds do because they're so visual, their visual acuity is much more sensitive than ours. Lux, measure of light intensity. We really don't use that much. And, you know, in our terminology, we more rely on lumens. But clux or the galalux is kind of the luminance perceived by poultry. And that kind of takes into effect the flickering. And lumen is really, and foot candles are really the measurements that we throw out mostly in the industry. And lumen is just a measurement of the total quantity of light emitted by a source per second. And then foot candles is the measure of illuminance. And it would just be one lumen per foot squared, foot candles. So if you have a source, it's one foot away, what is the intensity of that light that's being emitted in that spot? Okay, chromaticity, touched on that a minute, and that's again just the temperature of the light. If it's a warm light, it's going to have less than a 3,000 Kelvin rating, and that's going to be what we call the orange-red spectrum or orange-red light. Cool or neutral lights, they're going to, or the cool lights, excuse me, are going to be greater than a 4,000 Kelvin, and that's going to be kind of the blue-white light. 
is going to be a 3500 Kelvin. So that's going to be really not blue, not orange, just right in the middle. And it's again measured in Kelvins. And so this would be kind of the scale here. So here's kind of your, your warm lights, your incandescents are right around down in this range, about 2700, 2800 Kelvins. Your cool white fluorescence, 4,000, and I'm guessing that's what these guys are up here. And then daylight actually has a fairly high Kelvin reading. reading. It's really kind of a very white light in the middle of the day. And that is independent of color rendering index. And color rendering index just says, hey, when a light is on, do the things under that light, or do we see their true colors, or are the colors washed out? And this is a real good example of that. This would be an LED that has a really nice color rendering index. The, the feeders are very bright red. The things in there show their colors very truly. Versus the sodium lights, everything just seems orange. So that would be a very poor color rendering index. So that's just kind of your nickel's worth of um, background on lighting. So you can. When you start getting approached by lighting manufacturers, you can start asking the appropriate questions. Now, what got us started on lighting to begin with is we have a four broiler house farm, the university does, and we retrofitted to solid sidewalls about six years ago. And immediately my farm manager said, you know what, our electrical bill is going up. Well, we were having to rely more on artificial lighting. and." Um, as you can see here, it was taking quite a bit of lights, you know, electrical usage and lighting up front during brooding, and it kind of dropped off. And then, of course, our fans are kicking on because this is in the summer, eight week grow out. But kind of, you know, at the bottom, you know, at the end of the story here, lighting was about 31% of our cost for the electrical costs. You know, and then our, you know, fans, sump pumps, everything about 63% or that's 63 percent, and then that was our total usage there. So about 7,200 kilowatt hours. Not so bad if your kilowatt hour cost is pretty cheap. Something to look at if it starts going up. It was in Brazil, and they were telling me they pay 25 cents per kilowatt hour. So then when we looked at like a winter flock, we see that lighting is a bigger portion of our electrical cost. So right there we can see lighting in the summer, about 30% of our electrical costs. Winter, when we're not using our fans so much, 40%. So there's an opportunity right there. Well, why did we pick lighting? Since it really wasn't the most biggest cost, Feed augers, movement motors, small percentage of the overall electrical usage. So really not a big opportunity to improve efficiencies there if we were to upgrade. Fan motors, definitely our highest electrical usage, but it has a high cost of replacement to get more efficient fans. And, you know, in, and in relation to the energy gains, it really wasn't worth it. So lighting was just our best opportunity to reduce our costs. If we could come up with more energy efficient lightings versus our 60 watt incandescents, then we could um, help ourselves right there. So again, incandescents, most of the poultry houses in the U.S. 10 years ago had incandescent bulbs. They were dimmable, they're cheap, 50 cents a, for a 60 watt bulb but they are our least efficient source of lighting. You're, basically, we're just heating a metal filament till it glows. So we're producing a lot of heat there in order to get this light. And bulb production is going to be phased out in the next few years because it is so inefficient. Alternative lighting. So when we were looking in 2006 for our options, you know, to go to something more energy efficient, there were the cold cathode fluorescent lighting, the dimmable compact fluorescent lighting, and we tried these out and we said, hey, they're saving us 60 to 65 percent over our incandescent bulbs. Great, that's great, you know, we found our solution, let's move on. At the time, the LEDs, light emitting diodes, where electrons just emit light. That's how that creates the light. And there's less heat production, but there is some, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. They weren't available in 2006, so we did the, um, the, catho the um, compact fluorescence, and we were able to get the energy savings. But we were able to find out, like the rest of the industry, that they do have challenges. You, get, you start getting dirt accumulations on these CFLs, and you can reduce your light by, you know, 60, 70 percent, really hard on it. And so they have to be cleaned. 
They're very um, difficult to clean. You really have to be very, very careful when you clean them or you're going to lose the light. They're very sensitive to power fluctuations, which results in a very high failure rate. And that's been the big bane of our poultry industry is because we're, we went to these lights and people are having to replace anywhere from 20 to 30 percent each flock. So that gets to be a problem. Plus the CFLs contain mercury, so it's going to become a disposal challenge. Starting to be right now, we were with our project, had to dispose of a lot. It was costing us a dollar a bulb to get rid of them. They handled them like hazardous waste. The LED bulbs came on the market about three years ago. We were approached by an LED manufacturer to test the bulbs, and we said, well, okay, bring one out. We put one in. It made a light pattern about the size of a dinner plate, and I said, this will never fly. you got to give us more light spread in the barn. So they did, and they came back, and we said, okay, we'll give it a whirl. So the first bulb that we ever tested was one by Next Gen Illumination. It was a 10-watt bulb, 400 lumens, about 400 lumens, 120 degree light beam and that just means that's the spread of the light so we would think of an incandescent as a 360 it's going to light the ceiling the walls the floor everything this guy is focusing its light downward onto the floor 35,000 hour life was what they predicted we had the bulbs in our barns for almost three years never lost a single one we went with a neutral Kelvin, that 3700. Again, this is the color temperature of our light, so very neutral. Full range dimming capabilities compatible with the newer dimmers. LEDs do not dim linearly like an incandescent bulb. They kind of dim and you can turn, turn, turn the dimmer and then it finally falls off. So that's something that the newer dimmer technologies are taking that into consideration and programming that in. We combined our LEDs, because at the time they were pretty pricey, and they still are, with a 40-watt compact fluorescent for brooding, because we said, you know what, we're only using that brood light for a week. We're not having to dim it, so let's, you know, use a more energy-efficient brood light and not pay the big dollars for that one. So this is what it looks like. And then this would just be kind of the um, color rendering index of the light, kind of you can see a real uniform blend of the blues, the greens, the reds in there. And this is what they look like. L, um, LumaView. This was another bulb that we started testing. And um, it's a six and a half watt, 510 lumens, 6,000 Kelvin. We were kind of playing on that thought with well, the blue white stimulates growth. Let's go with the higher Kelvin. We really haven't seen that play out. And then, and then there's some thought out there that that high Kelvin is actually damaging to the human eye. So for the long haul, this was really not the way to go. 30,000 hour lifespan, these have been in barns for two and a half years, have not lost a single bulb under lots of conditions, no bulbs failures. Full ranging dimming capability. This one has a little bit wider beam spread of the light, so we don't quite have the shadows when our lights are on 20 foot centers. And then we again combine these with 40 watt CFLs. And then this is what that high Kelvin looks like. So almost like moonlight, if you will. You see some shadows here, but it's just because all the equipment's up and that's kind of causing it to throw. But again, with that high Kelvin, that 6,000, you can see on the color rendering index that the blue is really the dominant color in that light pattern. This was another one we tried, and I kind of want to throw this in because this was our learning lesson. This was had thin fins, and I didn't talk about it a minute ago. The diodes, while they don't put, create as much heat as the um, tungsten bulbs, they do some heat, so we have to have a way to move the heat away from those diodes. These guys have the thin fins. The LumaView just has a large case above it. The Next Gen has a thicker fin. These had some little tiny slits in there, as you can well imagine, that, that came to haunt us. 140-degree 100, light beam angle, you know, 10 watts, 400 lumens. Again, combine it with the broad light. And this was what it looks like. And then this is another one that's come on the market, and we started testing about a year ago. This is Once Innovation. They have the Iagri Shift. It's a 15-watt, 900 lumens. And it starts out at full light intensity. It's around 5,000 K. But as you dim it down, it actually goes into the higher um, Kelvin range, more blue-white. 
and it has full range dimming capabilities, 90 degrees, so a little bit more restricted in the light angle. And then this is what they look like in our barn. So this would be the once innovation. This is the new next gen. This was the three-year-old next gen. And then this is the LumaView. So you can see that neutral color, the, the 6,000, and then this was kind of in that 6,600 6, range Kelvin. So. so kind of what we found when we were running the incandescence, this is what we were using on kilowatt hours for these barns. Drop down to about 306 with the once innovation, 364 for LumaView, 611 for the next gen. And then this was our cold cathodes. I just threw it in. So you can see it was more energy efficient than the incandescence, but not nothing like what we were getting with the LEDs. And then if you were looking at this cost on a nine cent kilowatt hour, so we we're running anywhere. This barn has 75 lights. This one has uh, 90. So you can see that's the difference there. And then when you come down to these guys, just a fraction of the cost with the LEDs. And that's even including that one week with the 40 watt compact or compact fluorescence. On a 13 cent kilowatt hour, you can again see still getting a fraction of the you know, cost on using these bulbs. And we did a performance index because you know all these flocks were a little bit different on length of grow and so forth. So we said, hey, we'll just kind of figure out for each house, we can figure out the average weight, the amount of feed they eat, the livability, days to market, and multiply it by the electrical usage. And we were able to find that you know when we did our performance index, our incandescents were certainly the least efficient on our performance index. Once was the best, and at this time they were still fairly new, the LumaView, next gen, and then the cold cathode. So this really tells us right there, we were not sacrificing performance, and we were getting our energy savings. So hey, right there we're going, I think we're on to something with what we're doing. So we took this to the field demonstration. You know, it's all right. Dr. Watkins did it on her farm, where she's always doing bizarre and unusual things. What does that mean to us? So. We were able to get a grant through um, the, um, Arca uh, the um, Department of Energy to take this demonstration to the field and put it across lots of poultry farms in Arkansas. And we utilized 20 different broiler farms in Arkansas. We have 16 different complexes that participated. And we wanted to go with, the, with tunnel ventilated solid sidewall or dark out curtain houses. They had to be dark curtain house, dark houses that relied a lot on artificial lighting. And we started um, installing the bulbs in March of 2010, finished up by July 2010, and um, we monitored through this last December. Again, we used the next-gen bulb, the LumaView bulb. We had the power secure bulb in this demonstration. And then we also said we need to also use in our demonstration what we're already using for energy efficiency. The cold cathode, this is an 8 watt, 325 lumen, 2700 Kelvin, dimmable, no warranty on this one. And this was kind of what that light looks like. Kind of, you can see a little, you know, fairly good blend of light colors. Cold cathode, a frosted bulb, 4100 Kelvin. There were some flocks that weren't doing as well on the lower Kelvin, so we went with the 4100 Kelvin and got those out in our demonstration. Again, 8 watt, 325 lumens. This is kind of what that one looks like. A lot of more, a little more blue to it. And then the dimmable compact fluorescent. Hey, what if it's still the best choice? So we did a 15 watt dimmable, 1100 lumens, lots of light. Hold that thought. Brood lights on all these farms. Again, we said, you know what? We're only using those for about a week. So let's just, we're only using those for about a week. So let's just pick either a 23 or 26 watt non-dimmable fluorescent bulb. With the 23 watts, we'll put those in our low ceiling houses. We got about 1600 lumens. That's going to give us plenty of light. Our high ceiling, we have a lot of high trust houses. We'll go with the 26 watt. And then that'll give us 1800 lumens, a little more light. So then we're going to have plenty of light for brooding. In each of these farms, we gridded them. Before we changed out any bulbs, we came in and we gridded the light pattern. So we would, um, we'll just move to this picture. We start at the wall, the water line, the feed line, the inside, and they'd keep going all the way across. 
and then we would move 10 feet down and start the grid over. We do that for 120 feet, get all of these light readings and come up with an average value. So on this farm for brood and grow lights, they had about two and a half foot candles. Lots over the feed, the water line, not so much at the wall. On average, two and a half foot candles. And then we would turn the brood lights off and grid the grow lights. How much light do they have for grow? So here, you know, the wall, not so much. Fairly decent one foot candle at the feed line. On average, this farm had 0.86 foot candles of light for grow. All our participants in the program, they were at first, most of them were using 100 watt incandescents for brooding, 60 for grow, a couple of them had 150 watt sodiums for brooding. One had fluorescent tubes. We let these guys use, keep those bulbs because they wanted to. Two using 110 watts for grow, one using 75 watts. So just a little bit of everything. One had the 15 watt dimmable compact fluorescents, but he really wanted to try the LEDs. And most of our barns were 40 to 43 feet wide, 40, 400 to 500 feet long. So fairly standard production barns in our area. So what did we see? This, I think, kind of was a real telltale, was something we weren't expecting. When we were going onto these farms, and these were the farms that had the compact fluorescence, when we came in and gridded their barns, how much light do you have for brooding on average? Look what these guys had. Really not a lot of light for brooding. 1.32 foot candles, less than a foot. We came in, gave them their new lights, gave them either the 23 or 26 watt for brooding. Look how much all of a sudden they had for their brood light average in these barns. Guess what these guys were telling us? Man, I got my birds off starter two days earlier. This was the best block I've ever had. So we automatically gave these guys more light than they had and their flocks were doing better. But here's what happened. Over time, these compact fluorescents did not hold up worth a flip. By six blocks into this, these R's mean that we had replaced so many of their lights that we were no longer measuring the original lights that we gave these farms. So they were kind of holding okay. This guy did all right. But in six blocks, about a year, he now had half of the light that he had, or less than half the light that he had when we first started out. When we turned off the brood lights and just looked at their grow lights, you can see what these guys, I mean, this guy didn't even have 0.2 foot candles average light. We all of a sudden gave him a lot of light. And I think that this can kind of be important for that transition as you go from brood to grow. In our barns, we dim them down. But you know, if you turn a lot of brood light off and then it drops to that, you're going to shut those birds down where they're going, ooh, what's going on now? And it may take them a couple of days to figure out what's going on. So lots of grow light up front kind of helps them get transition. But again, it fell off within a year, so they're not holding their light output much. And we had replaced so many on these farms that by the end of our demonstration, they had completely rolled out. They were no longer in the demonstration because so many of the bulbs had failed. Cold cathodes, kind of same story. Not a whole lot of light starting out. We gave them their new lights. These guys, because that 325 lumens, we kind of took a hit here. This lady had the, the, tube, the fluorescent tubes. No, she had the fluorescent tubes. So this guy, we were able to really boost his light. This one, she had the fluorescent tubes, not so much. But again, so many of these guys had failures within six blocks that we were no longer measuring the original bulbs. They failed like crazy. And you can see here the ones that did hold up, we've lost about half of their light output. When we just look at the cold cathodes, same trend. We kind of lost light because of those lower lumens starting out with new bulbs, not so great. And then over time, we had lost so many that they had rolled out. So the cold cathodes were really maybe not the choice that everybody thought. Lumaview. This was the big one with the smooth casing, starting out, combining it with the 26, 23. We really improved their lights. And then they, you know, we've dropped off on light over time. But that has more to do with the compact fluorescent because when we only measured the LumaView LED, look how well it's holding up six blocks later. 
it's holding about 80% of its light output. And with this flat, smooth housing surface, it's fairly easy to clean and it doesn't tend to collect a lot of dust. So not real sure what happened here while they dropped off so much, but for the most part, they're, they're holding fairly well on their light output. Next gen, here's what these guys had brewed. Here's what they had when we switched them out. Six flocks later, you can see it's dropping off. Again, that tends to reflect more the compact fluorescent for brood. These guys have dropped off some. Seems like on theirs, it was all the drop off occurred in the first flock and then it held steady. So they're holding about 70% of their light output, 65 to 70% and holding steady. When we looked at average daily gains for our 18 month, and really these guys didn't hold out that long, you can see this is what they were having, 0.11 average daily gain with their, with, before we did anything with their incandescence. The demo compact fluorescence, 0.12, cold cathodes, 0.11, LumaView, 0.1265, NextGen, 0.1294, and then the Power Secure. I didn't include anything on it because they, about six to seven months into our project, had just a tremendous drop in light. They lost like 90% of their light. We had to pull them from the project. We had to pull them in our barns right at the same time. It was kind of an odd deal. So that's kind of just the buyer's beware. Not all the LEDs are compatible for our production barns. We think there were enough little slits on those bulbs. We got dust accumulation in there. It affected the diodes. They dropped off. So we have to really ask a lot of good questions before we go and buy bulbs because these guys, when those bulbs started failing, a couple of them they were loving their energy savings because they were saving about 85% over the incandescence they had and they kept holding on and their performance just went into the toilet. So that light output up front is critical. Want to just touch on this for a second. Am I doing okay on time? I think, yeah, I think so. Um, here, um, we um, did a big 10 house farm, and in this 10 house farm, the top five, they kept their incandescent bulbs. They were using 60 watt incandescent bulbs, and they were using for, brew, for growing, 100 watt incandescents for brooding. And then in the bottom five houses, we put in the next gen LEDs, and we also gave them a 23 watt comp compact fluorescent for brooding. And later the guy told me, he said, well, you know, I put those, those next gens in my bottom five because those were my worst performing houses. And I said, well, thank you for giving us a good and fair test here. So this is kind of what it looked like in his incandescent barn. And this is what it looks like with the uh, next gen. Again, the next gen has about a 120 degree light angle. We're not getting the throw to the walls where it's mostly focused, that light is, you know, we're not getting any light up on the ceiling, so it does perceive darker to us, because we're expecting light everywhere. But it's focusing down on this speed in water. And we're beginning to think that that's just the ticket. We've always thought we gotta have the whole place lit up like a nuclear power plant, but maybe if we're focusing here and we give them a little dark area to kind of go and hang out for a little bit, it's not so bad. We put on easy electrical meters on this farm, on an incandescent house, on a, um, the next-gen house. Here's our energy savings, 81%. Third flock into this, this farm had a, a lightning strike. Took out both easy meters, $4,000 worth of electrical equipment. Did not lose a single next-gen bulb. And the, if there was electrical surge in the line, what the next gen guys tell me is that bulb is just designed to just handle that surge. As if it were a wave on the ocean, it can just hit the beach and roll on, whereas most bulbs are going to be knocked out. So this guy has been so happy with his bulbs. Here's the fly in the ointment, as we say in the South. These bulbs are still pretty pricey. But we have the 50% rebate. So for less to uh, retrofit one barn, it was costing him about $875, or would have, we gave him the bulbs up front. At 10 cents per kilowatt hour, it's saving him about $135 per house. Estimated payback, seven flocks, one year, six flocks, 1.25 years. When the rebate rolled in, 
Les went out and bought the other five houses with the next gen bulbs. The next flock, he went to number one grower. So he's very, very pleased with the bulbs. So pricey, but one thing he said, you know what? We don't have to worry about changing out bulbs. We don't have to worry about failures. Everything's holding up very well. I was going to bring this guy. It's called a high bay, but the box was so big I couldn't quite figure out how to get it here. But this is a high bay, and we put one in in our barn, and you can see this really bright light there. And it puts, it's actually they've designed it, it's, a, it's an LED that they've designed for parking lots, for Walmart parking lots. And um, this is something that we're thinking about we may start using for brooding, or maybe even might be suitable for um, flight pins where you're, or the, for your breeder pins where you're wanting to stimulate those birds. We have um, a next-gen bulb and some breeder birds have been working with Dr. Anthony on this, and they've been doing very well. So that's at that mid-range Kelvin. They're doing very well. So kind of in summary, you know, LEDs are proving to have significant savings. They're durable. They're holding up if you write, ask the right questions. You know, is this bulb well sealed? Are the fins, if it has to be a fin bulb, are they good and thick? So if you do get some dirt accumulation on them, it's not going to impair the um, heat dissipation. Um, are, you know, these bulbs, what's, what's the light angle? These are some of the questions we need to ask because right now the LED industry is like the Wild West. Everybody's rolling in and they're wanting to get on the bandwagon. And we have to be cautious with who we're working with because so that we don't get burned. Already seeing the prices coming down. It looks like there's going to be some available that are going to be in the $12 to $15 range. We're testing some of those right now. So far, it looks good. We only had a couple of flocks, so not a lot of data yet. But, you know, there's some opportunity for there, us to have a bulb that's going to hold up. When we have the more restricted light angles, we are going to get a little bit of dark areas when our bulbs are on 20-foot centers, but it doesn't seem to be affecting their performance. As you saw in our field demonstration, those two LEDs, you know, had our highest average daily gain compared to the lights we were using already. I think the biggest lesson learned for me in this project, we need to rethink what we're doing for brood lights. You know, we were going 23, 26 watt compact fluorescence because that's what the industry used. That light is, you know, the, the lumen depreciation, it's falling off, dirt accumulation. We're losing so much light that I think it does affect our starts with our birds. That's why I've gone to a 40-watt compact fluorescent, 36, 40-watt, something bright, something to give those birds plenty of light to start out. And that's something that we're going to be looking at more. How much light do they need? Where does it need to be focused for best starts?